Welcome back. We should have Gary with us now from Prosperity. Now we've been talking about the first 100 days for Black America. Gary, thank you so much for sticking around with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely, Brittany. So, Gary, President Biden's plan says small business ownership is one of the country's cornerstones for wealth building and job creation. Black folks say, you know what? It always feels like we're struggling to get ahead. So what do you believe this administration will actually have to do in order to make this happen for black and brown folks? Well, the gaps are wide, meaning that, uh, you know, for every uh, 14 cents an African-American has a black person, a white person has a dollar. So, you know, the gap's pretty wide. So it's not going to be anything small that they're going to have to do. They're going to have to do some really large things in order to address this uh, perpetual gap that we see. So some of the things that they need to do is, number one, yes, entrepreneurship matters. Black women in this country are the fastest growing entrepreneurs in the country. And so in order to address the issue, we're going to have to invest in capital. We're going to have to invest in technical assistance and we're going to have access to markets also matter. So those three are the three key things on that on the entrepreneurship front. But I think we're going to need a generational approach. Uh, and uh, Senator Booker uh, actually has a bill, the American Opportunity Act, that um, really says that we're going to invest uh, uh, over a lifetime from birth to the time the person gets 18, uh, and then they'll have enough money to invest in uh, college or invest in uh, uh, for a business or invest in a home. Uh, these are the things that are critical for African Americans to do well. And doc, talking about that, Biden says they're planning to launch a historic effort to empower small business creation and expansion in economically disadvantaged areas, particularly for black and Latino businesses. He mentioned expanding access to 100 billion in low interest business loans to our communities and strengthening community development financial institutions. How will these help change? Well, absolutely. All of those things will matter. Uh, but again, it's just like you going into the store and, uh, you know, you're, you're going to say, well, now, uh, uh, after all of the, the things that have happened, I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to buy uh, something for my cold, but it's not going to be enough of something to actually solve your problem. So, so yes, that is going to matter. Uh, black businesses are in trouble right now. They actually need other kinds of capital besides just loans. They actually need grants to help support black businesses after this pandemic. So, I, you know, while I agree and I think that these are things that are worthwhile, I think much more has to happen. And so do you think we'll start to see some immediate change in the wealth gap once all of this stuff gets underway? Uh, I, no, I don't. I think you'll see some gradual changes uh, with the wealth gap in this country. Uh, so the wealth gap is driven in part by uh, uh, how resources are distributed. And if you maintain the resources distributed in the same way, you're going to get the same results. Uh, and so we need to change how the tax system is structured. We need to increase the earned income tax credit significantly. We need to uh, uh, also address the issue of employment for African Americans in this country. Uh, and so, you know, if you go back to 19... 59, African Americans actually were better off then than they are today. So we, we've got a lot of work to do. And so that brings me to my next question, because you actually wrote an article about that. Talk a little bit about that article that you wrote expressing that. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, there, was a, there was a book that came out called Upswing by Robert Putnam. And in it, he, he uh, talks about the fact that African Americans are no better off today than they were in 19. 68 economically. So across a lot of different measures, we've went backwards. Part of what he says, the reason for that is that every time African Americans move forward, there's a back, white backlash. So if you look at Reconstruction, there was uh, the Tulsa massacres and other uh, riot, white riots around the country uh, that, that pushed people back. We went through a long period of Jim Crow, segregation, lynching, et cetera. Uh, and then we get to 1968 and the passage of the Civil Rights Acts. Uh, and then there's another backlash in the war on crime, uh, the uh, dynamics around uh, welfare policy. All of these things have uh, accumulated uh, to, to actually put us back today worse than we were in 1968. In 1968, African Americans had the highest marriage rate in the country at about 60%. Today, 
Uh, that is, we have one of the lowest marriage rates. So the decline of, of, of family structure in the black community is actually public policy that has created the conditions that have transformed the black community. And you could, you could, you could go on uh, mass incarceration, uh, the uh, 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 proliferation of crack in our communities. All of these things uh, are, not, are things that are happening outside of our community that have helped to decimate our community. So when I wrote the paper, what I was really writing about is uh, I've written so many reports and others about the conditions of African Americans. And the fact is, is that it's not a logical thing, meaning we could write 100 more reports and nothing would change. What we really need to do is change our narrative. It really, we as a people actually have to have a strength based narrative and not a deficit based narrative. Uh, and there's a lot of research behind this, meaning social psychologists have demonstrated that if someone takes a test and they have a negative feel about that test based on how their group will do, it doesn't matter whether it's African Americans or women or other groups, that person will do less well on the test because of stereotypes. We, and black people, have lived under stereotypes all of our lives and are threatened by our identities have been threatened. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to actually have a stereotype boost. We need to have a stereotype lift that actually makes, uh, that actually frames our conditions and who we are in a strength-based narrative as opposed to a deficit-based narrative. Is there anything that you think that black folks should be doing on their own, any tools or resources that we kind of already have in our toolbox that you think will help kind of propel us in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, uh, the former great psychologist, the father of black psychologist, Dr. Joseph White, really talks about it, about our inner strengths. So we have inner strengths uh, that we don't even count as strengths, such as gallows humor. Uh, black people had to develop a gallows humor in part, in part because of the conditions that we live in. That's a strength. We also have strengths that have to do with resiliency. We are resilient people. We actually bounce back from adversity. Uh, and so there's these different positive strengths that you need to counter the narrative of the negative uh, uh, things that we're impacted by. We're worse at this, we're worse at that, et cetera. So I actually think that, you know, um, there is a lot of research that really shows that groups that have stronger social cohesion do better in a negotiated settlement than groups that are uh, separated. And so we need to come back to that belief that we are strong people, we have a great history, we are people that actually have overcome a lot, and we will overcome the situation we are in today. But that's what we need to focus on, is what is the positive narrative that we can say about ourselves. And lastly, Gary, within my last 20 seconds, what would you say we should be doing in order to make sure that we're able to move forward with the new administration in place, something that you think we have to do going forward? Well, one, I think we have to develop a, a, a concerted agenda. And I know there's many in the civil rights struggle that are attempting to do that, but we need an a, a agenda from the grass roots to the grass tops. And so I actually think having that agenda about what we agree on will strengthen our position in any negotiation with the Biden administration. That combined will in turn put the money back in our pockets? <laughs> that's that's what it's about. Absolutely. We need to put money in our pockets and, and roofs over our heads. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brittany. I really appreciate being here. Take care. You too.